Hello there, gang, and welcome to another episode of Displaying Model Behaviour. Got the arms all wrong there. <laughs> I don't have an arm routine. Hello there, gang, and welcome to another episode of Displaying Model Behaviour, the Earth's mightiest action figure video podcast. So take off your pants, crack a beer, and let's talk toys. Let's talk! about Extinction Agenda. Yes, it's another episode of As Told By Toys, the show in which you tell me what comic book stories you want to hear about, and I will talk you through them and show all the awesome action figures that can tell the tale on your shelves. This is a Patreon-sponsored show, so a big shout out to Ultrabra David for joining up to the Patreon and suggesting Extinction Agenda. And also curse you to damnation, for choosing a nine issue story. Hoo-ha! This is gonna be a big one, so let's not stand on ceremony, Mr. Wayne. Let's talk Extinction Agenda. So this story takes place at a time when all of the X characters are kind of converging, coming together in Westchester, and everyone's living in the mansion, and you can imagine it's getting a little bit crowded, but there's little elements that I'm not that familiar with in X-Men lore for a start, Storm is a little girl, and that's really interesting because I remember seeing the front cover to the X-Men issue where Gambit debuts, and he's on the cover with Storm, and I'm like, why is she drawn like a little child? That looks odd. That's, that's some bad penciling there. And then, no, she actually was de-aged. Just lost Frogman. And then, no, she actually was. He hopped off the shelf. Ayo! She was de-aged. See how quickly I just went back into filming mode? She was de-aged. <laughs> she was de-aged and turned into a physical child, but still with her Storm adult faculties. So, so she's trying to kind of find her way around the world, essentially. And she has some nice moments with Jean Grey where they're training together and kind of talking and having coffee. And it's one of those nice sort of personable moments that fleshes out the actual people behind the costumes. I really dig that. But things don't stay rosy for long. The X-Men are having a training session in the Danger Room, and of course then suddenly Cable barges in with the New Mutants, and he's like, all right, time for you all to get out because now it's the New Mutants' turn in the Danger Room, and this could be the start of a regular segment called Cable's Being a Dick. Cable's being a dick. Everyone quiet, cause Cable's being a dick. Cable just can't help himself. I think because I was introduced to Cable from the X-Men cartoon, all I ever think of when I see him is just someone going, my name's Cable, I'm from the future. I have to stop Apocalypse. I'm the only one who can save the world. I have to fight Apocalypse. And it's like, yeah, okay, maybe that's the case, but did you put your name down from 4.30 till 5.30? Because that's when we had the danger room booked. Fortunately, that doesn't last for long because while they're all bickering downstairs, Storm, Warlock, Boom Boom, Richter and Wolfsbane, managed to recall all of those names off the top of my head there, are outside the mansion in the grounds. They're kind of hanging out in bikinis. Hey, it's the 90s. Any excuse to draw the ex-ladies in a bikini, Jim Lee's down to clown. And I'm fine with that. They're outside getting along or not getting along. It's always a little bit bantery and bickery with the two ex-teams in the house when all of a sudden they are attacked by the Genosian magistrates. Now, Genosia is this little fictional country off of the African continent where they enslave mutants, kind of depower them, mind wipe them, and use them to build their economy. And the X-Men have had a run-in with them before, and it didn't go well for Genosia. And now they are coming back for revenge. So Storm takes it upon herself to seal the hatch that would let the other X-Men out onto the battlegrounds to help them because she's like, nah, this, this isn't a fight we can win. We gotta let these guys stay safe downstairs and then when we get captured, they can come and rescue us. Honestly, with the combined might of both X-Teams, I would have rolled the dice on that. I'd be like, hey guys, little help, but no, Storm very selflessly is like, nah, 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 y'all can come rescue us later. And that is what they have to do because eventually they get overwhelmed by the Genosian forces and captured. But while they're fighting, Storm sees that one of the Genosian attack squad is Havoc, the brother of Cyclops, and she's like, dude, WTF? But of course, no time to investigate this further because they're getting whisked into a portal back to Genosha. So the X-Men get teleported back to Genosha, and it's kind of a good little touch, I think, that they 
come through the teleporter naked. Not just for cheesecake, but it kind of makes sense. I'm like, okay, so the teleporter was like transfigured to their DNA. So it just literally teleports their DNA. Why would it take their clothes as well? I, I can buy that. But no time to gawp over that because we are introduced to one of the scariest looking villains I think I've ever seen. I love gruesome, gross, disgusting body horror. Don't know why, I just think it's cool. Cameron Hodge. A human head wired up and connected to this giant spider scorpion monstrosity robot body. So Cameron Hodge originally was in charge of Genosha and doing all of these evil mutant exploitation and experiments and that kind of thing. And that was when the X-Men had their run-in with him and Archangel... TCB takes care of business by lopping off his head. Unfortunately for the mutant population, Hodge actually has some kind of demonic deal. I'm not sure exactly what the backstory is, but he can't die. Which is, again, weird, gross, strange kind of curse. So he gets turned into this abomination. His head is still existing and it's attached to this robot and he is like, I'm gonna use you guys to build the rest of Genosha and Warlock specifically. I'm gonna use your body and your phalanx abilities. I'm gonna absorb them into my mechanical form and make like the ultimate body for myself. Kind of like Ultron in Age of Ultron where he's trying to upgrade his body, make it super badass. That's Hodge's plan. So he throws them all in prison while he just sort of thinks about what he's gonna do, I suppose. Now I know what you're thinking. Why don't the X-Men just use their powers to beat the bejesus out of Cameron Hodge and the rest of the Genosian magistrates and beeline back to Westchester? Well, I'll tell you, there is a mutant there working for the Genosian government called Wipeout who, as the name implies, can <laughs> just suck away all of their powers, plus the fact that not only is Cameron Hodge hideously terrifying, he's also one of those characters who has the power to have many powers, and he is just super, super jacked up. So it's not just a robot body, which we often see the X-Men tearing through like tissue paper. This guy is like nigh invulnerable, ultimate terrifying badass. So when they're all locked up in prison, Warlock's like, hey, I'm about to die, but if you give me some of your life, it sounds kind of sinister, but it's not. Warlock's kind of a sweetheart. Unfortunately for him, Cameron Hodge comes, takes Warlock, straps him up to a machine, and he's like, right, now I'm going to go ahead and absorb your body, so uh, deal with it. So Hodge takes Warlock to go and absorb his powers, and he has a conversation with this guy called the Gene Engineer. And the Gene Engineer is a scientist who basically reprograms the mutants, both mentally and physically. He strips them of their mind and consciousness, kind of turns them into zombies, and then he can genetically engineer their powers to more suit whatever the Genosian government needs them to do. And Cameron Hodge is like, right, you're going to take this guy and you're going to put this in me and turn me into this. And the Gene Engineer, they're kind of trying to sort of rehabilitate him a little bit. They're giving him all these emotional conflicts and he's like, ah, I just don't know if I should do this. And during the whole kerfuffle, Warlock manages to escape. And he goes back to the cell and he releases the rest of the X-Men. But really, like, heartbreakingly, he's too weak to be able to actually go and follow them. So he lets them out and they're like, right, we gotta go. And he can't physically go with them. It's a really sort of touching scene because they're like, well, we can't leave you. And he says, look, you can't carry me. Like, I'm too heavy and I, I'm too weak to move. So you have to go. So they run off and it's like... I kind of dig that because I'm one of those very logical people who it's like, no, that makes sense. You've got to do it. And you'd have these stupid heroes sometimes because you've got to be like stupid heroes sometimes where they're like, no, I won't leave you. We've got to stick together. I'm like, no, seriously, we can't. We will all die. Go. So I kind of dig that he did that. But that does mean that Hodge can take Warlock back, hook him up to the machine and start draining his life energies and whatnot. Rain, though, is a character I'm not that familiar with, but I've learned a lot more about her through this story. She sneaks off and goes and rescues Warlock. She breaks up the experiment, the energy transfer, it doesn't go through. She gets away with Warlock, and of course, Hodge is pissed because now he's stuck in this disgusting, cyborg, weird body, and he's like, well, this sucks. But what also sucks is that Warlock now is done. He's expended the last of his energy and he dies in Rain's arms and whew, I'm only just getting familiar with these characters and that actually kind of hit me.
Back in Westchester, Cable's being a dick again, to the surprise of no one. Blaming Storm for what happened, saying she shouldn't have sealed the hatch. And I can understand that, but still it's like, Cable, can you just dial it back a little bit, okay? We're all trying to deal with this. And while they're trying to deal with it, they see the news reported that Warlock has died in Genosha. I, I'm not sure like what the news programs are like, like how they get this information out and dispense it and whatnot. But nonetheless, it serves as a vehicle for the X-Men to see, oh wow we gotta step up and we gotta, we gotta deal with this now. And they actually get a call from the US government. The president flies them in, they meet with Val Cooper, and they say, all right, Genosha's gotta be stopped. You guys gotta go in and do this. But of course, full plausible deniability. We're gonna give you all the information you need in a nice little dossier and binder, and you can go over there, get the job done. But if you get captured, we don't know nothing about this. So the X-Men and the New Mutants are going to go to Genosha and whoop some ass. So the X-Men land on Genosha and are instantly attacked by the Genosian guards. And they have a pretty decent throwdown, actually. There's some really cool designs and drawings of the mech and the soldiers. The artists get to go nuts, and that's really, really great. And of course, Havoc ends up fighting Cyclops. And being the two brothers that they are, their optic blasts and their sonic effects and whatnot. It's not sonic, is it? It's like concussive blasts with Havoc. Either way, they don't affect each other. But like their clothes get shredded, but their bodies are fine. And of course, Cyclops really realizes, right, this is Havoc, you're clearly brainwashed, I'm gonna punch you back into consciousness. Which might sound silly, but actually apparently that did work in a previous story where Havoc was brainwashed, Cyclops just punched him back, which is like, hey, if in doubt, punch it out. In this case though, it doesn't work. Havoc remains sort of lucid, but still brainwashed and working for the Genosian government. And then as the X-Men are kind of winning the fight, the Genosian soldiers get teleported out and it's like, all right, we'll call it a draw. So we go over to see Richter and Boom Boom trying to escape through the city, and they're confronted by a bunch of Genosian guards. However, luckily, Wolverine and Psylocke show up to make the save. Jubilee's there too, but I mean... Pfft. Thanks for coming. So Wolverine and Psylocke, they knock out the guards and they decide to steal their costumes so that they can infiltrate the Genosian kind of high council base of operations, essentially. So Boom Boom and Richter, they're like, yo, okay, you guys go back, meet up with the X-Men, reconvene, Jubilee, do whatever you want. And now we can go in and actually take the fight to the Genosians. In the meantime, Storm breaks into the Gene Engineer's office and she's about to kill him. She's got a little shiv. Storm's kind of a badass, especially child Storm. That's always kind of weird but cool seeing this young girl being like super terrifying in a cool kind of way. And we also find out more about the Gene Engineer where he's got this backstory where his son ended up being a mutant and he was like, ah, oh, I'm all conflicted and all this kind of stuff. Again, they're trying to sort of humanize him, but at the same time, it's like, this is a pretty difficult character to feel much sympathy for. So Storm's about to off him, or at least she's thinking about it, when Cameron Hodge bursts in again. And Storm, without her powers, of course, she can't stand up to him. So basically he recaptures her, no problem. So Wolverine and Psylocke are flying into the Citadel on these cool little futuristic flying bike type things when Psylocke is overwhelmed by the psychic energy of Storm being tortured by Cameron Hodge and that just kind of fries her brain for a second. Luckily Wolverine is there to save her but then he sort of sees this image of Storm being tortured too so they both know what's at stake. So Psylocke and Wolverine infiltrate the Genosian base and that's where they're confronted by Havoc. And Havoc recognizes the uniform that they're wearing as the uniform of his Genosian girlfriend. It's interesting because he's brainwashed but he's sort of also still like he's got his personality. So it's an interesting kind of brainwashing. Either way, he attacks the two X-Men. They're having a fight and a kerfuffle. Psylocke stabs her psychic blade into Havoc's head which knocks him unconscious but then dang it, he seems to be everywhere at once. Cameron Hodge, in all of his grossness, lumbers forth and has this huge throwdown with them, which is really cool. And he gets the better of Wolverine. Psylocke just grabs a machine gun. There's something super cool about a sexy ninja with a machine gun. So that's just awesome with a little bit of extra awesome. Unfortunately, it doesn't do her much good. She even uses her psychic blade to try and land a fatal blow on Cameron Hodge, but he's like, Nah, -uh, I have the power to have many powers. And again, it's kind of a, it's a cheap writing technique to just magically make someone invulnerable, but also it really makes him terrifying as well. And it's at that point that he shows that Storm has now been fully brainwashed, mind wiped. She's no longer Aurora Monroe. She is just mutate number 23, I think it is, or something like that. So she's bald in a jumpsuit and it's like, yep, she's mine now. 
Back in the city, Boom Boom, Richter and Jubilee discover that Ran has been turned into a mutate as well. They see an image of her with her bald head, which looks really weird, with her pointy ears, and she is now mutate number 400 and something. And they're like, right, okay, we're aborting this escape plan. We got to go back and get her out. And I kind of like that the different team members have particular attachments to other people in the teams. Maybe if it was someone else, it'd be like, well, no, we still have to escape. But they're like, no. Ron's, Ron's one of us, we gotta go back and get her. In the meantime, Jean Grey and Cable are infiltrating the main Citadel, and of course, they are confronted with Cameron Hodge as well. This dude is a, he's quite a multitasker. I don't know why they even bother having a Genosian army. You can just have Cameron Hodge pretty much wrecking shop everywhere. So he gets in a fight with those two, manages to subdue them, and of course, Wipeout removes their powers as well, so they're pretty much neutralized. Boom Boom, Jubilee and Richter, they see this happening, but they manage to escape and continue. Again, I... I respect the intelligence of smart heroes who are like, okay, no, 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 we could just jump in and be like, no, but instead let's actually be sensible about this. Let them get captured. We're going to live to fight another day. We'll break them out later. In kind of a cool touch, as much as I make fun of Cable being a dick, because he often is, there was a really cool moment where because his powers have been taken away, he can't control the techno-organic virus that's taking over his body. So his arm starts to mutate more and it's really debilitating, but he still being the grumpy, stubborn badass that he is, attacks Cameron Hodge and manages to like rip out a bunch of his circuitry and stuff. And he is subdued, but that does get some badass points for Cable. That was a cool moment. Jean gets thrown into a cell with Wolverine and he is in a very bad state because something that a lot of people sometimes forget is that adamantium is poisonous and it's only his healing factor that stops that from killing him. So not only is he bleeding from all of these wounds that he suffered, but he's got adamantium poisoning as well. He's not doing too great, but he is doing well enough to steal a kiss from Jean. These two, I, I do love their sort of not even on again, off again. It's like the sort of the will they, won't they, will they get a little stolen moment here or there. I mean, props to Wolverine because that dude did not look good. Covered in blood and looking pretty gross and he's still like, give me some sugar, baby. And Gene's like, ah, well, when am I going to be here again? The rest of the X-Men, such as Archangel, Banshee, Cyclops, they all manage to sneak into the Genosian High Council base of operations and Cyclops confronts Havoc and they have another bit of a scuffle and this time... Cyclops manages to unmind wipe Havoc. So Havoc is back. He knows what's going on. He's like, right, okay, we can get this sorted. But again, the man who's everywhere at once, freaking Cameron Hodge, turns up. And Havoc, again, smart baby faces. We love to see this. He plays it cool. He doesn't let on that he knows what's going on and he's no longer brainwashed. So he just like steps back, lets the rest of the X-Men get captured, knowing that nah, 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 we're playing the long game here. But the bottom line from this is that, yeah, great job X-Men. Now everyone's caught. So all the X-Men are now put on trial in Genosha, kind of a kangaroo court sort of thing. And even though Wolverine's all bound up, when he sees what they've done to Storm, he goes crazy and starts attacking everyone with his arms behind his back. Again, classic badass Wolverine moment. So the X-Men are all turned over to the care of Cameron Hodge. It's like, do what you will with them. And I love the fact that we have so many different artists working on this story. They all draw the characters in different ways. And Cameron Hodge, depending on who's drawing him, just gets more and more disgusting and gross. And it's really cool when you get to see the artist just let loose and have fun with making a character as grim and gnarly as possible. So we get this awesome, weird, bizarre scene, which I just love the grotesque nature of it, where Cameron Hodge has a meeting with the president of Genosha, who herself is depicted as like pretty much Ronald Reagan in a wig. It's, it's not a good looking human being. But Cameron Hodge, I just love how weird it is. He's this disgusting zombified head on this cyborg spider scorpion body, but he wants to maintain a respectful kind of look and pass off as human so he's wearing a cardboard cutout human suit like over like around his neck and it's so bizarre and like a freakish fever dream it's really cool and just shows what a disgusting terrifying insane character Cameron Hodge is not only is he doing all of these awful things to mutants in Genosha but he's so bonkers and insane that he's like no I don't look like a hideous monster at all I'm wearing a suit can't you tell that's really awesome. 
So Cable and Gambit manage to free themselves and they start fighting and trying to escape. And classic heel move, Cameron Hodge uses Psylocke as a human shield to kind of fend off Cable and Gambit's attacks. And in doing so, he wounds Gambit like firing a piece of metal into his leg, which of course is going to come up later. Hodge then decides that he's going to have a little bit of fun and he forces Wolverine and Archangel to fight each other. You see, what he's able to do is use his kind of techno organic sort of body to override Archangel's wings. And this is something that I was never very familiar with because I haven't read this era of X-Men much. But from what I understand, it's Archangel's wings that are still kind of not under the power of Apocalypse, but because they were made by Apocalypse, they sort of have a bit of a will of their own. And that's really cool. I love that. That's what causes so much conflict in Warren Worthington. So the wings basically get bloodlust and they're desperately trying to force an attack upon Wolverine and Wolverine still doesn't have his healing factor so also when he pops his claws that can't be a good time so Wolverine's desperately trying to fend off Archangel without killing him which just for Wolverine in general like could you not kill people that's a bit of a handicap for a guy whose power is six blades on his hands so they're having a fight and Wolverine's desperately trying not to get hit with any of the poisonous razor feathers again it it baffled me when they took the razor feathers or the razor wings away from archangel for a while because it's like no those are the coolest mutant powers ever razor wings are badass while this fight is going on we get to follow jubilee and her gang they're tracking the gene engineer and they follow him to find out that he is actually secretly working against cameron hodge and what he's doing is putting all these various fail safes in place to actually counteract all the things that are happening in genosha again sort of character rehabilitation but not really enough to make him a good guy now over where the x-men are all being held prisoner gambit uses some of his cool thief type techniques to get that piece of metal out of his leg and use it as a lockpick to free everyone. I kind of like that. I love that it wasn't just a case of, oh, I managed to slip my cuffs or something. They put something in place that would actually work with the skill set that Gambit has as a thief. This is still relatively early in Gambit's run with the X-Men, and it's great that they can do all these little character traits and stuff to really flesh out who Gambit is and what he brings to the table. Cameron Hodge, suspicious of what's going on, goes to the gene engineer's office and kind of integrates his technology with his computer and finds out all the things that the gene engineer has been doing to work against him. So now not only is he a psychotic, terrifying, cyborg, creation, zombie, spider, scorpion thing, but he's realizing that everyone is turning against him and it's time to completely just lay waste to all those around him. As the X-Men are then trying to escape, they're confronted by Storm, and we think that she's attacking them, but actually, she is able to return their powers to them. This is kind of cool. It turns out the Gene Engineer, this was his secret weapon against Cameron Hodge and the rest of the Genotians. Rather than brainwashing Storm and taking her powers away, he gave her the ability to return all the X-Men's powers to them. That's kind of cool. So now we've got everyone juiced up, back to full power, and ready for the last big throwdown fully powered X-Men against Cameron Hodge and again this is just that kind of comic book trope where some characters are invincible as long as the story needs them to be. You would have thought the entire X-Men team would have absolutely jobbed out a cyborg robot but this is just a cyborg robot who happens to be powerful enough to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the entire X-Team and again you're making a terrifying villain that's fine by me, I'll dig that. But eventually, a bomb that was made by Forge causes the ground to fall away and Cameron Hodge falls through it, which buys them some time to continue their escape. Now, the New Mutants find the Gene Engineer and it's all explained what he's been doing to try and subvert the machinations of Cameron Hodge. And together, they start trashing the various power stations and supplies that actually give Cameron Hodge a lot of his power. So while he's having another big battle with the X-Men, his power starts to fade and fail. So now the tide is starting to turn a little bit. All the X-Teams converge together on the fight with Cameron Hodge and everyone is using their powers in different ways to just try and take him down but it is an uphill struggle like this guy is uber juiced up and jacked and even though they have landed a few good hits and they're draining his power in various ways it's an uphill struggle and at one point he actually manages to grab the Gene Engineer. He, Cameron Hodge, manages to grab the Gene Engineer. Pronouns, pal. Makes life easier when telling a story. And he snaps the Gene Engineer's neck. And uh, we're supposed to kind of like maybe feel a little bit bad for him. But honestly, nah, not really, bud. You kind of threw your lot in with the wrong people here. But now we're really getting down to the final big battle. 
So the final fight is now taking place, and it's taking place in different stages all over Genosha. Like, it's a big epic thing and we've got the Genosian magistrates battling the X-Men and the president gets captured and there's like a splinter cell inside Genosha who are fighting for freedom as well and ultimately it turns out that the good guys are kind of winning. So the president of Genosha gets captured and they're saying right she's going to stand trial for her crimes against mutant kind and humanity and so we're going to try and turn Genosha around but in the meantime we still have the terrifying psycho cyborg scorpion creature that's wrecking shop and trying to kill everyone so that's another battle that is still going on and there are some cool creepy moments as well where Cameron Hodge would like get storm cornered she's all alone he's like chasing after her like the Terminator Archangel tries to save her but Hodge spews like some acidic gunk all over him there's again real just gross body horror stuff but finally the big confrontation I keep saying the big confrontation like the last three four five issues of this are the big confrontation, but it's all very widescreen, cinematic, quite awesome stuff. They're having a huge big battle on top of the skyscraper, and literally all of the X-Men just power into Hodge, using everything at their disposal, blowing off limbs, ripping him to pieces, until finally, like, his neck gets severed, the body gets destroyed, and it is just a head that's clunking on the ground. Again, so gross. So Hodge's head gets knocked off the roof of the building, but of course, he lashes out this disgusting sort of cyborg tongue that grabs onto Havoc, and he's trying to pull him over. Luckily, Jean Grey uses her telekinesis to free Havoc, knock the severed head of Hodge off this skyscraper and pull the two X-Men to safety. But again, that's not it because Hodge in this horrible curse gross thing cannot die. So eventually he's confronted by Ran who now she has all of her mental faculties back as well. But she's got a little bit of a caveat with that where when she's in her human form she still is like mind wiped. But then when she's in her wolf form in her feral savage kind of form then she is lucid and she literally picks up Hodge's head and, and he's like I, I can't die I don't he's not shrugging but if he had a body he'd be shrugging she's like fine you can't die well let's see what happens when I literally rip your face to pieces and throw you into like a crater in the middle of the ground and then Richter uses his powers to bring the entire skyscraper down on top of the mangled, mutilated, severed head of Cameron Hodge. And damn it, if that doesn't kill him, it's going to put him out of action for the longest time. And finally, that puts a stop to one of the grossest, grimmest, most terrifying, awful villains the X-Men have ever faced. What an epic conclusion to that battle. Now the dust is settling and it's time to decide what is going to happen and Ran and Richter decide that they are actually going to stay in Genosha and try and help this new Genosian government rebuild the country and make things right for all that they've done against mutant kind. They're going to stay there and help rebalance the scales. And then the rest of the X-Men, so the New Mutants, X-Factor, they return back to Westchester and they have with them Warlock's remains as well, which was kind of nice. In a little earlier bit in the story, they find a an urn, essentially, with what's left of Warlock, which was kind of convenient, but also it's nice because then you get some closure. They take that back with them to Westchester and they scatter his ashes in the garden of the mansion. And that is the end of Extinction Agenda. Whew, boy, that was kind of epic. Nine issues of really The Great Escape. There's stuff that I thought was amazing in this story and stuff that I thought was kind of padding and filler. This one felt a little bit stretched out here and there, but the good stuff was great. Like I said before, I love the disgusting, gross body horror of Cameron Hodge and the fact that the artists can be so creative with how they depict him and really just go nuts with the design. Lots of the characters have been represented by action figures, but Lord knows there are a lot that we still need to put on our shelves, especially a giant hideous Cameron Hodge builder figure. Oh, that is one I would definitely pick up. And folks, that does it for this episode of As Told by Toys. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did and you want me to cover a story of your own, then you can go over to patreon.com forward slash displaying model behavior, throw a few shekels my way and nominate a story for As Told by Toys. So thanks very much for watching guys. And until next time, keep displaying model behavior.
my name's Cable. I'm from the future. And I'm here to tell you that if you go over to patreon.com forward slash displaying model behavior, just like all these folks did, then you can request a video for As Told by Toys. I can't watch it, though. I'm too busy. I have to stop Apocalypse. I'm, I'm going to go do that.